May the spirit of imagination open our minds to new possibilities. May the spirit of love open our hearts and join our hands. May the spirit of justice move us to work for the liberation of all people. And may the spirit of community challenge us to open our circle wider and wider still. Welcome to video worship at the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos for October 10th, 2021. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your journey, we are glad you are here with us. I'm Ann Marsh, Worship Associate. Our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, is on sabbatical, and during his absence, we're hearing from a wonderful variety of pulpit guests. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, my friend and colleague, the Reverend James Galasinski. James is in his sixth year of settled ministry at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Canton, New York. Before that, he served the First Unitarian Church of Albuquerque, where he fell in love with the mesas, the mountains, and the red chili of New Mexico. James enjoys listening to jazz, growing tomatoes, writing poetry, and hiking with his wife Ulrika and their two sons, Miles and Oscar. Today, James invites us to explore spooky entanglement and inseparability, the scientific and spiritual dimensions of our connections to each other and to our world. Welcome back to Los Alamos, James, and welcome to all of you. Please join me in these words as we light the chalices of our homes and hearts. We light this chalice for the web of life which sustains us, for the sacred circle of life in which we have our being, 
for the earth, the sky, above and below, and for our Mother Earth, and for the mystery. Each week, the words of our affirmation remind us of why we come together and of the promises we make to each other and to our wider world. In that awareness, I invite you to speak these words mindfully as we join in our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is the sacrament and service is its prayer, to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve life and fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each and with all. No words have been written in our virtual prayer book this week, but our joys and sorrows, our loves and losses, are part of who we are and are woven into the journey we share. So let us take a moment now, as candles burn in our sanctuary, to bring to our minds and hearts whatever hopes and fears, endings and beginnings, pain and beauty we carry with us this day. As nature's seasons turn, let us turn toward each other. When flowers are touched with frost, may love keep our hearts warm and remind us that we are all, every one of us, held in creation's hands. Please join me in the peaceful pause of meditation. Let yourself sit quietly and at ease. Allow your body to be relaxed and open. Your breath natural, your heart easy. Imagine with me that the very air in your room was breathed by a bee that lived a hundred years ago. And some air in your room from a blue whale which last blew its blowhole two centuries ago. Imagine with me the very carbon we are made up was once part of a dinosaur. 
Let us be and breathe more mindful of our relations in this moment of shared silence. Please join me in the spirit of prayer, source of hope and truth that is mysteriously, ordinarily, obviously, and eternally present within us. May we attempt to live out a universal love named by many names and traditions. And may we remember all those in our lives who are suffering in body, spirit, or mind. May they find healing in every way that is possible. And all the people in the virtual sanctuary said, Amen. I know that indigenous culture plays a big part in New Mexican culture, but there is much indigenous wisdom that we overlook, especially here in New York State. The native people known as the Haudenosaunee are really a peaceful and long time alignment of six nations. In Canton, New York here, we live and move upon the traditional territories of the Mohawk, the original people of this land and one of those six nations. The Haudenosaunee say we have relations with all the natural world and everything has spirit and should be thanked. Since we have relations uh, with everything, they use words like mother, brother, sister to describe our relationship with the natural world. The Haudenosaunee open and close every social and religious meeting with the Thanksgiving address. It is good to have Thanksgiving even when it is not Thanksgiving. And they wish that all children everywhere would join in this Thanksgiving address. So here's sort of an outline of what that address looks like. They first greet and give thanks for all people. And then they say, now our minds are one. I invite you to say that with me. Now our minds are one. 
we greet and give thanks to Mother Earth. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the waters. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the fish. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the plants. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the food plants. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the medicine plants. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the animals. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the trees. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the birds, acknowledging the eagle, the leader of the birds. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the four winds. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to thunder and lightning. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the sun, our eldest brother. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the moon, grandmother. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the stars. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the wisdom keepers. Now our minds are one. We greet and give thanks to the creator. Now our minds are one. Of all things we have named, it is not our intention to leave out any, anything out. If something has been forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send their greetings and their thanks in their own way. May we all discover our relationship with everything and may our minds be as one.
Our reading today is a short passage from a novel about physics and human relationships. It's in, the novel is entitled Gut Symmetries by Jeanette Winterson. The title relates to guts, or G-U-T-S, Grand Unified Theories. Winterson writes, Now, more than ever, our place in the universe and the place of the universe in us is proving to be one of active relationship. That is more than a scientist's credo. The separateness of our life, of our lives, is a sham. Physics, mathematics, music, painting, my politics, my love for you, my work, the stardust of my body, the spirit that impels it, clocks diurnal, time perpetual, the roll, rough, tender, swamping, liberating, breathing, moving, thinking nature, human nature, and the cosmos are patterned together. I was interviewed by a local newspaper about three years ago, and I was asked uh, about the core beliefs of Unitarian Universalism. And I said that central to who we are is the concept of the interdependent web of existence. We are all connected. It is a scientific fact and a theologically rich concept we like to chew on. As a follow-up to that question, the journalist asked, is it like quantum entanglement? And I said, sure, it's like quantum entanglement. Well, guess what the newspaper printed? Unitarian Universalism, according to Reverend Galazinski, believes in the concept of quantum entanglement. So this sermon was written shortly after that newspaper article was published and congregants began asking me about the relationship of Unitarian Universalism and quantum entanglement. So back in 1935, Albert Einstein met with two younger colleagues and tried to save classical physics from all the quantum weirdness that was going on. Einstein was skeptical of the theories of the very small world of atoms and subatomic particles, and electrons, protons, and how they behave and interact with light. Physicists were just beginning to know that when small particles are measured, they change their properties. Their properties are not definite. 
absolute and unchangeable. The observer changes them by simply observing them. Einstein insisted there must be some cause to this mystery. Physicist Abraham Pice recalled going on a walk with Einstein when he suddenly stopped, turned to him, and asked whether he really believed that the moon exists only when you look at it. Classical physicists presuppose an objective reality. The moon is there, no matter if humans are looking at it or not. At the time that Einstein believed we lived in an orderly universe, which is fundamentally rational, that there should always be a reason why things happen. He couldn't just believe in quantum theory, though he knew the math was correct. He even mocked quantum entanglement, calling it telepathy and spooky action at a distance. After all, quantum mechanics goes against our whole grand notion of cause and effect. Gravity, space, time, the speed of light, and materialism. But math and the latest experiments conclude quantum entanglement is a reality. Physicists like David uh, Bohm and John Bell were once even laughed at for even pursuing this non-location, this non-separability. Quantum theory destroys the old paradigm that matter is inert stuff, divisible into indivisible atoms. Sir Isaac, Newton, uh, Sir Isaac Newton's laws were being broken. According to Newton, God in the beginning formed matter beginning in a solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles. But the atom now has morphed into a woozy, wavy, micro cloud, writes theologian Catherine Keller in her book, The Cloud of the Impossible, Negative Theology and Planetary Entanglement. She extends Einstein's moon metaphor the moon may be there, but not exactly the same moon. Without observers, it is a ghost of itself, a cloud of its endless possible selves. Physicist and philosopher of science, Bernard de Espan, says a rainbow is actually a better analogy he talks about this in his book, Physics and Philosophy. If you are driving, you see the rainbow moving. If you stop, it stops. If you start again, so does the rainbow. In other words, its properties partly depend on you. Einstein was initially wrong. The supposed objective observer changes what? is observed. What is this mysterious cloud of materiality? What is the non-knowable that spooked even Einstein? What is the entangled non-locality of non-separability? This impossible complexity of relations happens at the fundamental level of everything. And behold, my friends, I promise you something. In this explanation, I will include no math. Quantum entanglement means that two particles, which were originally linked and then experimentally separated and fly off in opposite directions, still remain immediately responsive to one another. It's as if they are still linked no matter the distance. They respond to each other when they are measured. No matter, if, no matter if one particle is in one lab and the other particle is in another lab in a building across campus, or for that matter, if one particle is in New York State and the other is in New Mexico. It would be like if 
you rolled dice in Las Vegas and in Atlantic City, I rolled dice and they both came up with the same number every time. However, it is not by random chance, but because they are interdependently connected. Something here moves faster than the speed of light. Shocking and mysterious, isn't it? Einstein was right, definitely right in one regard. It sure is spooky, isn't it? As the uh, Danish physicist Niels Bohr said, anyone who has not been shocked by quantum entanglement has not fully understood it. I am no scientist, but I like the mysterious context physicists are leaning into. Science has once again become uncertain, indeterminate, like theology, like philosophy, like life. Quantum physicists are admitting we live in a non-knowability, an infinite unknowable abyss. They are asking big questions of the fundamental framework of nature itself. What are things and what are we made up of? As it turns out, reality is more like looking at a rainbow the properties of which depend on you, the observer. And entanglement plays out in our lives in many, many ways. I'd like to give you one example. Eight years ago, when I was an intern in Wisconsin, I ministered to a teenager and, and their family who was in a confused spot. Then just two years ago, that a sibling of that person, a vulnerable teenager who was transitioning gender identities, was locked up as an adult in a county jail in New York State. I got a call one uh, evening. You live in New York State now, right? Could you help? I had to look up where the jail even was. We had just had a baby and I could not drive the three to four hours downstate to try and help. But I had a great relationship with a UU minister that served a congregation a mere 45 minutes from the jail. And she happened to have experience, a lot of experience in sexuality issues. And it turns out the minister that I had, was in relationship with drives past that jail every day to work. So she ended up visiting that teenager many times. But here's where it gets spooky. That wasn't spooky. That was coincidental. Months later, my family and I went to Burlington, Vermont, sort of randomly. We went out for pizza and in a dark corner, there sat the mother of the teenager who I had not seen for eight years. The next day, I saw the mother of the teen and the teenager at the UU church in Burlington, and they both, and they had gotten out of prison. The world is made up of these relational events. I'm sure that all of you have some sort of story that involves humanity as entangled we cannot be determined separate from our relationships. We are known by our relationships. Space and time is somehow superseded by the power of relationship. Quantum entanglement is when two particles entwine in, are entwined even at a distance and remain one physical system. Human entanglement is when two humans share a bond and are then separated in space yet are in still, are still in relation. Though spatially separate, they still act as one. This spooky entanglement becomes apparent 
when someone we love dies, we are still entangled, even at the point of death. We are in a complicated situation with everything, even the dead. We are part of an involvement, part of an ongoing undertaking. Things are connected at the deepest of levels. The world of Sir Isaac Newton's separate entities is a sham. The world is entangled. And I think we can be mindfully aware and unaware of this spooky mystery. Division does not mean a thing to the building blocks of nature. Walls will never fully separate us. Despite the imagined divisional crisis in our country, the spooky present whispers, we are one. We sing to the spirit of life, but quantum entanglement means there is a spirit in everything. The Haudenosaunee are right, and everything is worthy of greeting and thanksgiving. Entanglement might be a great metaphor for weddings as well. Two romantically entangled particles. Entanglement is a metaphor. This permeates all of existence. Relationship goes all the way down. The spooky, unknowable, non-separability is almost enough to deify. The forces of relationality that bind us all, I believe, are divine. Of course, we are connected to the ancestors historically, physically, and culturally, but it is a deeper and wider. All of life is connected. A frog em embryo doesn't look that much different from a human embryo. The things we do affect the environment. The theophysics of quantum entanglement go all the way down past the ecological web of life. Quantum entanglement points to a responsiveness, a mindfulness, a type of consciousness at the base of everything. Matter is vibrant. Matter is feeling, conversing, and desiring. Matter, like life, is a series of events and experiences, and according to theologian Catherine Keller, our very own electrons undo straight materialism. Matter breaks up from below and makes us all queer. If non-locality is true, everything is relation. If non-separability is true, even the creator is a relation. There is no one purpose, but many, many possible purposes. There is no theism and there is no atheism that can excuse us from becoming together now. Again, Keller says, we are of the universe. There is no inside, no outside. There is only intra-acting from within. As Jeanette Wintersong says from our reading, this is no longer a, a scientist credo. The separateness of our lives is a sham. Planetary entanglement is real. Humans are contributing to polar ice melting. Sea levels are rising. Unjust wealth distributions affect the entire planet. The truth of entanglement means that St. Francis was right when he said the sun is our brother and the moon is our sister. It means that people crossing the Rio Grande into Texas are connected to us. And putting out food, water, and shelter, we are responding to that connection. 
with love. It means the political borders and the walls we construct are all shams. It means Harry Belafonte was right when he said, we come from the fire, we come from the mountain, we come from the water. We meet here in the matter of each moment, alive to the possibilities of becoming. It is a moral call and an invitation to relationship with all that is. Amen and blessed be. Thank you, James, for helping us see entanglement in new ways, encouraging us to awaken from the illusion of separateness and reminding us that our relationships are holy. Next week, the Reverend Jenny Amstutz, minister in Littleton, Colorado, returns to our virtual pulpit with reflections on the complex emotions that come in times of transition and change. Because of the COVID situation, our church board has decided to continue online-only video worship for now. Children's programs are outside with masks, and masks must be worn by everyone inside the building. The board is monitoring COVID data closely and hopes we'll be able to meet again in person soon. Meantime, thank you for your patience and trust as we navigate these tough times together. Please join us for online worship at 10.30 and for coffee hour by Zoom at 11.30. The links for these are in our email announcements. If this is your first time with us, we invite you to sign our virtual guest book, and everyone is reminded that you can submit personal joys and sorrows for our virtual candle lighting. The Reverend John Cullinan will be on sabbatical until November 1st. Until that time, we invite you to send any questions, comments, or requests to the church office. The links for doing all these things are on our website and in the service notes under this video. For information on upcoming events and other ways to connect, please check our Facebook pages and email announcements. Thank you for being with us. Together, we strengthen our hope that hand in hand and heart to heart, we can make our vision of justice and compassion a reality. One step toward building the world we dream of is to share our resources with the wider world through our online offering. During the month of October, all offering funds will be given to the Roadrunner Food Bank, which is dedicated to ending food insecurity in New Mexico. As a food distribution hub, Roadrunner provides food to hundreds of food pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, and regional food banks, along with special programs for children, seniors, and families. Please use the Givelify app on your mobile device or the link in the service notes to make your contribution. Thank you for your generosity. May the offertory music lift your spirits, and may what you give bring you joy.
All we have are these events, movements, and experiences before us. It is all relations. Move through this sanctuary with the spooky unknowability that we are eternally entangled and forever inseparable.